Text, Indeed, One Search, All Jobs, at Indeed ENG, Monthly Tech Talks at Indeed's Austin Headquarters, Engineering.Indeed.com. Emotep, Large-Scale Analytics and Machine Learning at Indeed. The presenter walks to the podium and starts a slideshow. Hello. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you all about Emotep, which is our system at Indeed for analyzing large amounts of data and also doing machine learning. So I'm Jeff Plaisance, as Andrew said. I'm the engineering manager for the search quality team. And I help people get jobs. And Indeed is a search engine for jobs. Job search results on Indeed with a blank what field in Austin, Texas in the where field. We go out on the web, find all the jobs that are available, pull them into one place so that job seekers can come to one place and find the job. If you go search for a job on Indeed, this is what you're going to see. So here's results for a person who wasn't sure what query they wanted to do. So they don't know what kind of job they want. They just know they want a job in Austin, Texas. So this is our search page. And we're continuously experimenting with changes to this page. But to do that, we need data so that we can be sure that all of the decisions that we make are improving the experience of the job seeker when they use our site. Indeed is a data-driven organization. We try to make sure that there is data to back up all of the decisions we're making um, as much as possible. So data-driven organizations need great tools in order to deal with the data they need to make these decisions. You need to be able to ask the right questions of your tools, and you need to be able to interact with and explore your data sets. Title, what does Emotep allow you to do? Decision tree building, analytics. So Emotep is our primary tool for doing that. And Emotep allows us to build decision trees, as Andrew talked about last month, for those of you who are here. And analytics. It also runs most of our analytics systems. Indeed's analytics philosophy. Analytics systems should be, one, interactive, two, not sampled, three, not approximate. So in Indeed, we have a philosophy about how analytics should be done. So analytics systems should be interactive. You should be able to do your query on the system and get an answer within seconds, a minute, or at most. Very, very quick, so that once you see that result, if you think, oh, maybe I want a little bit different question, you can change it and then run it again and iterate on the question that you're asking until you're asking the right question. And if, if you have to like put in your queries a day in advance and then wait for data to get collected and then go back and look at the results, you're not going to be able to quickly find out what you need to know to make the right decisions. So we also believe that analytics systems should not downsample. When you start downsampling your data set sets, you can still get the same answers at a high level, but you lose the ability to drill into your data sets and really find the anomalies and the outliers in your data. So as soon as you start downsampling, you can't do that anymore, which it's not good. It's important to find the outliers and fix them, or account for them, whatever the case may be. And also, analytic systems should not approximate things. Uh, so the issue with approximations is that they introduce assumptions. So if I have an operation that I can do that's an approximation, and I as the programmer know what the assumptions that that approximation is making, when I go and do that query, I can take that into account subconsciously and ac account for it. But if someone goes into that system and, and runs that same query and doesn't maybe know how it's implemented and know what the assumptions are, they might get a result that is a bad result. But they won't know it because of the approximations that you've done. So if there's some kind of like leaky abstraction in your approximation, you can get serious errors in your results. Text, Emotep answers questions. So Emotep is a system that, we like to think of as a system that answers questions. And one question you might ask Emotep is, what was the weekly average query time in the last quarter from people doing the query software? So Emotep can answer that question. Can also answer the question, what percent of job search results pages are for page two and beyond? So how many of our job seekers didn't get the results they wanted on page one or wanted more results? 
And it can also answer questions like, what are the top five most common queries in each country? But the first question we're going to look at is, what was the number of job searches from March 9th to March 23rd? Text. Total job searches from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014. A bar graph with a huge blue bar labeled with a question mark. But before we can even answer that question, we have to kind of define what we're counting as a job search here. Indeed job search results with Indeed software engineer in the what field and Austin in the where field. Text. Query, with an arrow pointing to the what field, and text. Location, with an arrow pointing to the where field. Next, one of the search results is highlighted. Text. Impression. So we're going back to our search engines result page here, our job search page, and we've got a query and a location. So in analytics, we think of this page here as being a document. It's something that you're searching and that you can do analytics with. So this, this search is an event. This event has properties. One of the properties of this search, this search event, is that it had a query that was done by a user. It has a location. It has a set of 10 impressions. So this is an impression. One, one of these results is what we call an impression. It has some other properties, like whether or not the user clicked on the impressions or not. Text, document, query, Indeed software engineer, location, Austin, impressions, 10, clicks, 2, time, the 17th of March 2014 t 12 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds. Next, text, shard. A dark gray box with blocks numbered 0 to 14. The zero block is orange. The rest are gray. So there's a lot of different things we can have in this search event document. So that's kind of where the Emotep system starts. It's at the document level. So this is a document in our job search index. We've got a query, a location, a number of impressions, clicks, and the time that it occurred and maybe some other fields that I'm not showing here, but then we're gonna zoom out one layer here. So the highlighted part is, is our document, and what we're seeing here is one layer zoomed out, it's what we call a shard. It's like a piece of, uh, of our, the bigger picture, but it's a set of documents. And it's important to note here that these documents have an identifier, which we call a doc ID. Next, text, server. Six icons labeled documents in a gray box, each with different dates. And it's, uh, it's an integer. It starts at zero, and they're consecutive. That's going to be important later. So then we're going to zoom out one more level here to the server level. The server in Imhotep consists of a set of shards. The gray box turns orange. So here's our server. We've got six shards on this server. And as you can see, each shard corresponds to a time range. So MOTEP is a time sharded system. We take our events that we get in, we split it up into time ranges, and the documents from a time range always go to the same shard. Text, cluster, three document icons labeled server A, the 2nd of March 2014, server B, the 3rd of March 2014, server C, the 4th of March 2014. Server A is orange. Going out one more level, we have the, the whole cluster. Server A turns gray. So, several machines, each having several shards, each shard having several documents. An orange icon labeled client pops up with arrows pointing up to each server. And if you want to interact with this system, this is the layer at which you do it. The client here creates a session talking to all the machines. So if you're accessing the system, you're going to be accessing all of the machines in the system in parallel. So also of note is that the session is like, it's a stateful thing. So if I want to start talking to Amotub, I'm going to open the session, I'm going to do some operations, and then I'm going to close it later. The total job searches graph again, but this time the bar is labeled secret. So let's go back to this example here. How many job searches do we have between March 9th and March 23rd? This is actually a really easy question to answer given what I've told you so far. All we have to do is find the shards of our job search index that correspond to that time range and count the number of documents in each. I'm not actually going to tell you what the answer is, but that's how you would do it. The graph changes to dated from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014.
the bars are varying heights. Now, let's ask a slightly different question. How many job searches did we have per day in that time range? And there's going to be a little bit different way of doing that. It's going to be, uh, require explaining a few more concepts here. Text, metrics, 64-bit integers, exactly one value per doc, random access by doc ID. The first of which is metrics. So a metric in Imhotep is a number. It's defined to be a 64-bit integer, and a metric has exactly one value per document. Within the Imhotep system, we have random access to these metrics by doc ID, which is one reason why it's important that doc IDs start at zero and are consecutive. We use an array for that, so that's how they have random access. Text, um, metrics, time, clicks, impressions, revenue, or anything else that is a number. So some examples of metrics. Time is a metric. There's one time value per document in our job search index, the time at which the event occurred. Clicks is a metric, how many clicks happened. Impressions is a metric, how many jobs do we show. Revenue is another metric, it's a very important metric. Anything that's a number and has a single value, exactly one value per document is a metric. Text, groups. The next concept is group. Text, documents are placed into numbered groups. Every document starts in group one, Group zero means filtered out. Each document is placed in a group within the context of a session. So the groups have a number. When you open your session, every document starts in group one. They can move to other groups throughout the course of the session, with group zero being a special group that refers to documents that have been filtered out. So those are removed to docs that you don't care about in your session anymore. Text, groups. Groups are stateful and scoped to a session. Regroup operations update group for each doc in shard. So the groups are stateful. They're scoped to a session. When you create your session, uh, we, we in initialize the group state. You can manipulate it during your session. And when you close your session, we throw that state away. And you do these operations called regroup operations in order to move the docs between different groups. Next slide text, metric regroup. Iterate over doc underscore ID to metric lookup. Set group to value minus start over bucket underscore width. Useful for making graphs, buckets on x-axis. Five boxes numbered one to five under a line marked start on the left and end on the right. A line above box one is labeled width. So let me tell you one type of regroup operation that we could use for this query about how many job searches happen per day. We call this one metric regroup. So the way a metric regroup works is we take a metric, we iterate over the values for that metric, and we take that value and we take a start value. In this case, the start value would be the start time of our query. We subtract the start value from our metric value. So the, the metric value is the time at which the search occurred. We can divide by the bucket width. So the bucket width here would be one day. So you know, convert it all to the same time unit, so seconds. Do the division, and it'll give you a group number. And so the server will do all this with just three parameters, you know, start, end, and bucket width. And this is really useful for making graphs, for defining your x-axis for a graph. It, it does this bucketing feature, which is really nice for time series graphs. Text, get group stats. For each group, sums a metric for all docs in that group. Lastly, there's a get group stats command which for each of our groups is going to sum a metric for all of the docs that are in that group. Text, bucket by day. One, regroup on time metric. Two, get group stats for count metric, always one. So for our example, we're gonna regroup on the time metric, and then we're gonna get group stats on the count metric. So we wanna know for each of our groups, each group corresponding to a particular day, how many of our documents fall into that group. Count is always one for every doc, no matter what. The same bar graph showing total job searches per day from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014 per day, with blue bars of varying heights. Next slide text, total and US job searches from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014 per day. The blue bars are thinner and now there are red bars that are shorter than the blue bars. So that'll answer our, this question, how many job searches happen per day? in this time range. Our next question is a little more complicated. It's how many job searches happened per day between this time range in the US?
so Inletype can also answer this question. It's going to require going a little bit further into inverted indexes, because inverted indexes allow us to very efficiently do this operation. So to go further, I'm going to have to explain how an inverted index works. Text. Inverted index. Like index in the back of a book, words equal terms, page numbers equal doc IDs, term list assorted, doc list for each term assorted. So an inverted index is like the index in the back of a book. The words in the book index equate to what we call terms in an inverted index, and the page numbers in the book index equate to what we call the docs in the inverted index. So we're going to have a, a list of terms, and for each term we're going to have a list of docs, and our term list is sorted. That's important because we need to be able to binary search our term list to be able to find the term that we're looking for for the query. And our doc list is also sorted, and you'll see why in a second. Text, standard index, a table with five columns. Doc ID rows are numbered zero to four. Query rows are software, blank, sales, software, blank. Country is Canada, Canada, US, US, US. Impressions are 10, 10, 5, 8, 10. Clicks are 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So let's first talk about how an inverted index is sort of constructed. So if we start with a standard index, which is just a list of documents. So we have five documents here, four fields. The fields are query, country, impressions, and clicks. And we have values for each of these fields and each of these documents. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to find all the unique terms in each of these fields and sort of explode this view so that we know which term occurs in which document. So here's what that looks like. Text. Constructing an inverted index. Now the previous rows are listed in one row with check marks in the doc ID rows. So we can see that software uh, in the query field occurs in document zero and also document three and so on. So the next step in constructing an inverted index, and this is the actual inversion here, is we're going to flip the rows with the columns. Now the table is flipped with columns labeled fields, term, and numbers zero to four. So right now we've got the fields across the top and down we've got doc IDs and we're just going to flip that around. And this is what that looks like. So now we've got our query, uh, our fields, and then our terms for that field. And then for each of those terms, we have some docs. And the last step here is just going to be compressing that set of docs into a sorted list of docs, like so. So now we have a list of docs for each of these terms. Text. Inverted indexes allow you to quickly find all documents containing a term, intersect several terms to perform Boolean queries. An inverted index allow, uh, they allow you to quickly find all the documents containing a term. And you can kind of build on that to find all the documents containing one term and then find all the documents containing another term and then do more complicated operations to intersect those term lists to perform complex Boolean queries. Um, so any kind of Boolean query you can implement easily on top of an inverted index. Text, Lucene, open source inverted index implementation, reasonably fast, widely used, well tested. And if you need an inverted index implementation for some problem you have, you should use Lucene. It's open source. Uh, it's fast, it's widely used, and it's well tested. Text, global and U.S. job searches from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014 per day. A bar graph with blue bars of varying heights next to shorter red bars. So, back to our question. How do we find out which of these searches were in the U.S.? Text, searches in the U.S. only. A table with columns labeled field, term, and doc list. We use our inverted index. The row with country, U.S., and two, three, four turns orange. So the first thing we're going to do is go to the, the, the term U.S. in the field country. The orange area expands to fill the slide. We're going to zoom in on that here. And then that gives us a doc list. Text. Query regroup. Regroup all docs which do not match a Boolean query to group zero. So the operation that we perform on Inlotep in order to do this is what we call query regroup. It's the second type of regroup we're talking about. And what a query regroup does is it regroups all the docs which do not match a Boolean query to group zero. So in this case, our query is a one-term Boolean query, which is, does this document contain the term country US? So one term. 
If you remember, group zero is the filtered out group. It's a special group. So that's going to filter all of those docs that don't match this query out of our data set so we can count the remainder and that'll give us our count per day. Text. Term regroup. Splits docs in a group into one of two new groups based on presence slash absence of a term. A circle numbered one with arrows pointing down to circles numbered two, country, US, and three, everything else. The next type of regroup is what we call uh, a term regroup. I want to talk about this one real quick. So a term regroup will split your documents that are currently in a group into one of two new groups. And it does it based on the presence or absence of a particular term. So we could also use this term regroup for our country US query. So in this example, if we have the term country US in the document, it goes from group one to group two. If we don't have the term country US, it goes to group three. And if we just counted group two, we could perform the same operation here. But we actually use query regroup in practice for this. Text, multi-term regroup. Generalization of term regroup to n terms and n plus one new groups. A circle numbered one with arrows pointing down to circles numbered two, country, US, three, country, Canada, four, country, France, five, everything else. Next is a generalization of term regroup that we call a multi-term regroup. So a multi-term regroup, uh, you give it n terms instead of just one, and we're going to get n plus one new groups out of that. So as you can see, we've got country US, country Canada, and country France is, is our three terms. And then in our fourth group, everything else. So if it contains country US, it goes in two, and so on. And this is another very useful type of regroup. Text, total and US job searches from the 9th of March 2014 to the 23rd of March 2014 per day, with the same accompanying graph. So this query, we're answering it with a query regroup. Text, inverted index compression. Size of organic data set for last five months. Original, 102 terabytes. Inverted, 51 terabytes. So our inverted index here started off as that standard index I showed you, which is just a set of documents. That's that, for our organic impressions data set. For the last five months, that's 102 terabytes of data. That's pretty big. Uh, you wouldn't really want to put that in RAM on one machine. That's expensive. Uh, so the inversion itself is a form of compression. It's sort of like dictionary compression because you're taking your terms and only storing one instance of it and then just storing in, uh, a number for each instance of it. So the, the inversion itself actually cuts the size of the data set in half from 102 terabytes to 51 terabytes. That's still really big. Text, inverted index optimizations, compressed data structures, Better use of RAM and processor cache, better use of memory bandwidth, increased CPU usage and time. Micro-optimizations matter. So, in practice, for inverted indexes, you need to do a lot of optimizations to make them fast. And the primary type of optimizations in inverted indexes is compression. And the reason that you need to compress your inverted indexes is because compression gives you a few things. It lets you fit more of your index in RAM. So the more of your index that you have in RAM, even if it's compressed, the faster you can access it, given that your compressor is fast enough. It also counterintuitively makes better use of your memory bandwidth. So if I have a compressed data set on disk, I can load more information into RAM when I copy those bytes than if it was uncompressed on disk. So I, I, if I compress it on disk, load it into RAM, and then decompress it, I get higher information throughput, not data throughput. The data throughput's the same, but the amount of input of information that I'm moving is greater with compression. So this comes at the trade-off of higher CPU usage and time to decompress. So in practice, inverted index compression algorithms are extremely well optimized. And this is a very active area of research. Text, delta slash variant encoding. Doc ID lists are sorted. Delta between a doc ID and the previous doc ID is sufficient. Deltas are usually small integers. Use less bits for small integers and more bits for large integers. So the most common inverted index compression method is called uh, delta and variable length integer encoding, or variant encoding. So the way that works is you have your doc list, 
So as I said earlier, your doc list is sorted. You can replace your doc list, so it, it was a sorted list. You can also represent that as the difference between each doc and the doc before it. So each doc and the previous doc. So that's, that's the delta between the docs. You can restore your full doc list from that information. So the deltas are gonna be very small numbers in comparison to the original doc IDs. They're gonna be small numbers. And the key to this is that we, if we use less bits to store the small numbers with the trade-off of using more bits to store the larger numbers, we will save space overall. Text, delta encoding, a table with three columns and two rows. Field, query, term, nursing, doc list, 34, 86, 247, 301, 674, 714. So, delta encoding. Another row appears below with doc lists 34, 52, 161, 54, 373, 40. So, this, if this is our doc list for the field query, the term nursing, that's what the delta encoded version of that doc list looks like. It's just, just the differences between the adjacent terms. That's all we have to store. And we can restore the original doc list from that information. Text, small integer compression. Gollum slash rice, variant, bit packing, P for delta. All but variant gray out. So there's a few different methods of small integer compression that are commonly used in inverted indexes. You need to use this in combination with delta encoding for it to have any benefit. So the one we use is called variant encoding. So I'm gonna explain that now. Text, variant encoding 9,838. So let's say we wanna variant encode the number 9,838. Below the number, four sets of eight cells with zeros and ones appear. The first step is, well, we're gonna look at what that number is in binary. So this is the representation of that number as a four byte binary number. In variant encoding, what we do first is we take the least significant seven bits of our number. The bottom two rows gray out, leaving the top two rows. Now all the numbers in the top cells are zero. Sorry. If you look at this number, you can see that there's no useful information in the top two bytes. It's just all zeros. The top groups gray out. The cells in the bottom row brighten. They have zeros and ones. In the low two bytes, you can see that there's a lot of information. There's 14 bits of information. The cells all darken except for seven in the bottom right group. Next, a new row of eight cells appears below, with a question mark in the first grayed out cell and the others white, containing zeros and ones. So, in var encoding, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the least significant seven bits and write them in the low seven bits of our first output byte. The bottom cells gray out except for the question mark, which turns white. We then have the question of what is the top bit of our output byte? What is the eighth bit of our output byte? So we need to look at the remainder of the number to determine that. And the way we do this in variant encoding is if there are ones, if there's remaining information in the rest of the bits, we're gonna store a one in this top bit to signify that another byte follows this one. Otherwise we put a zero. The cells all turn white except for seven in the lower right and bottom groups. Next, the question mark changes to a one. So here we can see that we do have ones. We have remaining information to code. So we're gonna put a one in our uh, output. The cells turn gray except for six in the left and one in the right bottom groups. A new group appears below the others. The first cell is gray with a question mark. The others are white with zeros and ones. Next, the top rows, the first two cells of the second row, and the lowest question mark turn white. The other cells are gray. We then take our next least significant seven bits and write them to the low seven bits of our next byte. And again, we look at the remainder of the bits. Next, the top four groups turn gray and the bottom two groups turn white. They're all zeros, so we don't have any more information to encode. So we signify that by putting a zero in the top bit here. So. As you can see, this is our variant encoding of 9,838. It's only two bytes instead of four, so we saved 50% space. Text, inverted index compression. Size of organic data set for last five months. Original, 102 terabytes. Inverted, 51 terabytes. Delta slash variant, 17 terabytes. So, for back to our organic data set example, with 
The original data set, it was under two terabytes. The inversion brought it down to 51. And the delta var in encoding is going to bring that down to 17. So that's a very big savings. So we've, we've cut the original data set down by a factor of six. So we can buy you know, six times less RAM to, if we want to keep that whole data set in RAM. And then for whatever amount of RAM we do have, we can fit more of it in RAM so we can access more of our data set faster. Text, Flamdex, two files per field, term slash docs, can add fields without rebuilding index, faster variant decoding, no TF or positions, or wasted time decoding them. We actually have our own inverted index format that we use in Imhotep. It's called Flamdex. So in Flamdex, we have two files per field. We have a terms file and a docs file. This is useful because we can add fields to our index without rebuilding the entire index. So if we have a derived field or something, we can add it later and not have to rebuild the whole thing. Whereas in Lucene, all the fields are in the same file, so to add a field, you have to rebuild the whole index. Flamdex has its own variant decoder implementation that is very fast. It's faster than what's currently available in Lucene. And the other thing about Flamdex is that we've omitted term frequencies and positions. So this is a feature that you normally want in an inverted index that you're using to serve search queries. But for analytics, for Imhotep, we don't need them. So we don't have them because we don't want to waste time with them. We don't want to waste time decoding them or anything. So we just drop that feature. Text, variants, pros, compression, can fit more index in RAM, higher information throughput per byte read from disk. So variants. Variants are nice because we get good compression. We can fit more of our index in RAM, and we get higher information throughput for the information we're reading from disk, and also into higher levels of the cache, higher levels of the memory hierarchy. Text, variants, cons, decodes one byte at a time, lots of branch mispredictions, not too fast to decode. The downside is that this encoding I've told you about, you have to decode one byte at a time. Uh, this requires one branch per byte, with, and it's a highly unpredictable branch. So there's a lot of branch mispredictions. Branch mispredictions are one of the slowest things you can do on a modern processor. So variants are generally not all that fast to decode. We have our own variant decoder that is a little bit better. So what it's going to do is it's going to decode 12 bytes at a time. Text, vectorized variant decoding, 12 groups of binary code in three rows. And I'm going to tell you how it does that. Here's our 12 bytes. The first number in each group turns a color. Zeros are green, ones are purple. PMOVMISC B, extract top bit of each byte. The colored numbers group together below to form a 12-digit number. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the top bit of each of these bytes. We're going to use an Intel instruction called PMOVMASK B to extract the top bit out of each of these bytes into a number, into a 12-bit number. And as 2 to the 12th is 4096, we're going to take this number that we got out of the top bits of these bytes and look it up in a 4096 entry lookup table. Text. Pattern of leading bits determines how many variants to decode, sizes and offsets of variants, length of longest variant in bytes, number of bytes to consume. This lookup table is going to tell us a lot of things about this number. It's going to tell us how many ints we're going to decode out of this number. It's going to tell us the sizes and offsets of the variants. It's going to tell us the length of the longest variant that we're decoding. And it's going to tell us how many bytes of this input we're going to consume. So let's look at this number in detail. The first zero is highlighted. As you can see, the first bit is a zero. That means the first integer in this list is a one byte integer. Now the second and third numbers, one and zero, are highlighted, then zero, one and zero, one and zero, zero, and the last three ones. Then we have a one zero, which marks a two byte integer. It's our second int. Our third int is a one byte. Then we have another two byte, another two byte, we have a one byte, and lastly, we have this. We can't decode this on this particular pass because we don't have a, we don't have a zero. It's just three ones. That's not a full int. So here, we had six whole ints. The longest one was two bytes. The three ones gray out. We can decode nine of these bytes in this pass. Uh, then on the next pass, we'll catch whatever this next thing is. So we have decoding options for up to 12 one-byte variants at a time in parallel six one to two byte variants, 
four one to three byte variants or two one to five byte variants. We can do all that. So in this case, we're gonna decode six one to two byte variants in parallel. And the first step of this is that we're going to pad our one byte variants out to be two byte variants so that we're only dealing with two byte ants. Fortunately, there's an Intel instruction that makes that really easy. It's in the SSS E3 instruction set. It's one of my favorite instruction sets. <laughs> it's called PShuffle. Text, Intel SSS E3 instruction to shuffle bytes. It lets you shuffle the bytes around in a register. Text, vectorized variant decoding. The same 12 groups of binary code, but now the last three groups are grayed out. Text, decode six variants from nine bytes. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to decode six variants from nine bytes here. The first, fourth, and ninth groups are highlighted. Text, pad out one byte ints to two bytes. Next, the first, fifth, and eleventh groups are highlighted along with the next groups, which turn into all zeros. We've got three one byte variants. We're going to pad them out to two bytes. So PShuffB does that for us. We just pass it the right operand, and that happens. So that's another thing we looked up in our lookup table. It was the operand to PShuffB. So the next step here is that we actually have the least significant bytes first. That's not going to work. We need them second. The groups with all zeros switch with their preceding groups. The first numbers are colored unless the group is all zeros. Text, reverse bytes in two byte variants. So we're going to reverse the bytes here. So I'm just going to do that. Text, mask out leading purple ones. The third step is that we need to mask out the ones. Our, we don't care about our connecting bits anymore. We know that we're only dealing with two byte numbers. All of the leading ones turn into green zeros. And so we don't need these ones and zeros anymore in the middle. So we're just going to mask them out. It's an AND instruction. Every other group is highlighted. Text, shift top bytes of each variant one bit right. Mask slash shift slash or. Lastly, we need to shift the top bytes over by one bit. So that's just going to be a mask, a shift, and an or. The highlights all shift one number to the right. Next, the highlights and colors are gone. Text, around 10 instructions, no branches, less than two instructions per variant. And so we do that. And now we've encoded, or we've decoded, six integers in around 10 instructions without any branches. And it's less than two instructions per variant. So this is going to be a lot faster than doing it one byte at a time. Text, Emotep spends about 40% of its CPU time decoding variants. This is really important for us because Emotep spends around 40% of its CPU time decoding variants. This is the bottleneck in Emotep. Text, vectorized decoder about three to five times faster, decompresses at 1.5 gigabytes per second, about two times overall system performance. This vectorized decoder is around three to five times faster than the one we pulled out of Lucene originally. And uh, it can decompress around 1.5 gigabytes of data per second. So switching from the original decoder to this decoder gave us around a uh, double the overall system performance. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is a different type of query. So this is a, what we call a top terms query. Text, top five locations, a query builder screen. And what we're asking here is what are our top five locations that people search for jobs in? That's what they are. But let me tell you how we're gonna actually figure that out. Text, term stats, a table with cities in column one and numbers in column two. If we had this thing called term stats, which is, let's take a field, and for that field we're gonna go through every term in that field and get some stat, the sum of some stat, in this case count, for that term, the number of docs that contain that term, we could answer this query. So we get our term stats, we find the top five by count, and then that's our answer. So we're gonna have this concept of a term stats iterator, which for each term in a field, we're gonna sum a metric across all the docs containing that term. Text. How do we compute this across many machines? And, but then we have the issue of having to compute this across a set of machines. It's not just one machine. Um, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have these sorted inverted index, indexes uh, with these terms already sorted in them. So from each of these machines, we're going to be able to generate 
a sorted term stats iterator, sorted on the term. The table is now split into three tables of four cities. So here we have three sorted term stats uh, iterators, sort of from the, the bottom up. And we're going to read the first element of each. The top three rows of the first table gray out. Next, the first three rows of the second table gray out, then the first three rows of the third table gray out. So from the first one, we're going to see that we have Atlanta with a count of 16. From the second, we're going to see we also have Atlanta, count of 12. And the third, we have Atlanta with a count of 21. Text, Atlanta 49, appears in a blue row below the tables. Now we're going to compare them all. We see that they're all the same. So we're going to sum the counts, and we're going to output that into our merged term stats iterator. The three Atlanta rows in the tables gray out and a new row appears above the Atlanta 49 row. Next, the Atlanta rows disappear. Now the Austin rows are all highlighted. Below, the blank blue row reads Austin 14. Now we're going to look at the next element of each of these streams, advance the pointers. So now we have Austin, Austin, and Austin again. So here, again, we have the same term from all the iterators, so we're just going to sum and then advance again. The Austin rows in the tables disappear and the next rows are highlighted. Text, Boston 12, Chicago 19, Boston 13. So next up, we have Boston, Chicago, Boston again. Text, Boston 25, in a blue row. The Boston rows in the table gray out. So here, we can see that Boston is only in two of the iterators. And to keep our output iterator sorted, we need to make sure that we're outputting the lower of the terms that we have available now. So we have two terms available, Boston and Chicago. Boston comes first lexicographically, so we're going to output Boston on this iteration. And then we're going to advance only the two iterators that contained Boston. The Boston rows in the first and third tables disappear. Now the highlighted cells are Dallas 5, Chicago 19, Chicago 9. Text, Chicago 28, in a blue row. The Chicago rows gray and disappear, leaving Dallas 5 and Dallas 8. So now we have Chicago, same thing, and then Dallas is our last term. Text, Dallas 13, in a blue row. The tables above are cleared, leaving only the blue rows. Yeah, and that, that's, so that's our merged iterator, and then we can find our answer by streaming through it and finding the maximum. Six triangles in a row, labeled TS1 through TS6. Each has a line going up to meet at a triangle above, labeled term stats 1 to 6 with an orange arrow pointing up. So, here we have six of these term stats iterators that we're going to be merging. You can imagine that this algorithm generalizes to any number of term stats iterators that we're merging. But you can imagine also that if we scale this to like a million iterators, it's going to get pretty slow. Next, there are three triangle and line groups, labeled TS1 to 6, TS7 to 12, and TS13 to 18. It doesn't scale infinitely here. So one thing, one approach we could take in order to scale this up is to layer our merge. So if we can merge six iterators quickly, then we can merge six iterators on each of three systems. An arrow points from each group to a triangle above, labeled term stats 1 to 18 with an arrow pointing up. And then each of those will output another merged iterator. We can then stack that and have another merger, merging from those three streams, to get a total merger, merging everything. So this merger here, though, is probably going to be a bottleneck. We have this last step that's completely sequential. Everything here has to go through that step in order to be accessed by the client. Text, Amdahl's law. The speed up of a program using multiple processors is limited by the time needed for the sequential fraction of the program. Whenever we have a sequential bottleneck in a parallel system, the first thing to consider is Amdahl's law, which tells us that the maximum speed up we can get through parallelization of our system is dictated by the time needed for the sequential step. Text, sequential part of FTGS as last step in merge, can we distribute some part of the final merge? In Imhotep, the sequential part of this uh, term stats iterator is going to be the last step in the merge. So if we can distribute that work better, more than we've done so far, 
we can get better parallelism. We can get a better throughput overall. Text. Hash partition plus interleave. Send all stats for each unique term to the same thread based on a hash of the term. Interleave merged terms. So the way we actually do that is through this, what we call hash partitioning and then interleaving. So for our original iterators, we're going to take each of the terms out of that iterator and compute a hash. Say we have eight merging threads. Our hash is going to be from 0 to 7. And based on that number, that term will go to that thread. So the same term is always going to go to the same thread. So that thread is going to get all the stats for that term. And then after we've done that, we can take our eight output iterators and interleave them. We don't actually have any merging work left to do because we've already done all the merging there is to do. We're just interleaving. The three group triangles with arrows pointing up to a triangle again. So here, in our original merge implementation, we expect that the final merger is going to be receiving in streams, and each of those streams is going to uh, contain the same t terms. So it's going to require like n times t work to do that final merge step. So n times t. And then in our hash partitioning scheme, the streams received by the interleaver are going to contain disjoint sets of terms. And if we have n merge threads in our interleaving scheme, in our hash scheme, each of those uh, merge threads is going to output t over n terms. And our final interleaver, we're going to be getting n of those streams. And you can see how n times t over n, the n's cancel. And we're only doing t work. So previously, we were doing n times t work. And in this hash partitioning with interleaving process, we're only doing t work. So it's, it's faster. It's got a lower complexity. Here's going to be an example of how that works. The three tables with four cities each again. First, we're going to hash our terms. The Dallas, Boston, and Atlanta rows turn green. Green is going to represent terms that hash to zero. Green arrows point from each table to a green table below. They're going to go to one merge thread. The Chicago and Austin rows turn orange. Orange is going to represent terms that hash to one. Orange arrows point from each table to an orange table below. They're going to go to the other merge thread. Now, we're going to zoom in on our green merge thread. The orange rows and arrows disappear, leaving only the green rows and one blank green row under the tables. So, this is going to change a lot in a second. So, there we go. This is what our green merge thread is receiving from each of those original streams. Now, we're going to do the same merge procedure we did earlier. The Atlanta rows are highlighted. So, we're going to look at the heads of each of these streams. Text. Atlanta 49, in the green rows below. We're going to see that they all contain, contain the same term, and we're going to sum them. The Atlanta rows in the tables disappear. The next three rows are highlighted. We're going to repeat this process. Text. Boston 25, Dallas 13, in the green rows below. Next, the new green table moves up and an orange table appears beside it. Text. Chicago 28, Austin 14. Below is a row of two gray cells. Merge the term Boston. Merge the term Dallas, just like we did before. Except now we've got three terms. They're all merged. And then we're going to do the same thing for the orange terms. And then we're going to, at our interleaver, we're going to get these two disjoint sets of terms coming in. So we only have five inputs here, whereas before we had more. So the, the cardinality here has been reduced to just the number of unique terms that we have in our overall system. And then we're just going to interleave them. So we look at the, the heads of each stream. Take whichever one's lower, in this case Atlanta, output it first. As he says the cities, they drop down to the table below in order. Austin is next. Then we've got Boston, Chicago, finally Dallas. So that's our interleaving scheme for that. It, it's faster than our previous merging. Text. Shard distribution. Lots of data sets for different event types. Each data set is split into one shard per hour slash day. Each shard has two replicas for fault tolerance. How do we assign shards to machines? So our next topic is going to be shard distribution. So we have this problem of we've got all these shards of these data sets. And we have data sets for different types of events, of events as well. So we might have one for people doing searches on our job search product. 
Maybe we'll have another data set for people doing searches on our resume search product. So those are each a distinct data set. And each data set is split into one shard per hour or day or some time range. And in our system, each of these shards has two replicas for fault tolerance. So we can lose one machine in our system and we've lost no data. It's all still accessible. You can still do queries and everything. So we have this problem of how do we assign these shards to the machines that we have available. Text, shard distribution considerations, space, load, hot spots, adding slash removing machines. The considerations we want to look at when we're uh, designing our shard distribution algorithm are going to be space. We want to make sure that we're using the same amount of space in every machine. We're not filling up one machine before another. We want to make sure that we're sending the same amount of query load to each of our machines. So that'll balance the CPU time. And a very important consideration here is that this system is very susceptible to stragglers. So that if you don't, if you don't balance properly for query load, you're going to get into situations where you have one machine that's doing a whole lot of work, and when you're merging these sorted streams, you can only merge as fast as your slowest producer. So if you have this one really, really slow producer of the this, this stream, it's going to slow the whole system down. So we really don't want unbalanced query load. We also really don't want hotspots. And lastly, we need to be able to add and remove machines to the system in a way that we can rebalance our shards to still meet all of our other balance criteria. Text, homogeneous versus heterogeneous systems. Must decide how or if you will handle heterogeneous hardware. Cannot balance for both space and load on heterogeneous hardware. So the first thing we have to decide when we're setting up the system and how we're going to run it is whether we can handle heterogeneous hardware. So we have to decide if, if or how we're going to handle it. Text, homogeneous versus heterogeneous. A document icon with arrows pointing to a big box labeled 3 terabytes and a smaller box labeled 1 terabyte. And I'm going to assert that you cannot balance for both space and load on heterogeneous hardware. And the reason why, okay, so you have, say you have a 3 terabyte machine and a 1 terabyte machine. And you've got some shards. The 3 terabyte box is labeled 12 shards, 50% capacity used. The 1 terabyte box is labeled 4 shards, 50% capacity used. So let's fill each of these to 50% capacity. See what happens. So we've got 12 shards on the big machine, 4 shards on the little machine. They're both 50% full. If I'm a client of this system and I want to query 5 shards, I don't get to pick which shards I'm querying. I can't say I'm going to query two on this machine and three on this other machine. My question requires that I want to ask the system requires me to query a very specific five shards. Four of the 12 shards in the big box and one of the four shards in the smaller box turn blue. An arrow labeled red hotspot points to the 12 shards label. They may only be on that big machine and it's very likely that we're going to get an unbalanced distribution here. So what that's going to do is it's going to cause read hotspots on the big machines. We're going to be reading more data from those. We're going to increase the query load on those big machines. The 3 terabyte box is labeled 8 shards, 33% capacity used, with an arrow labeled wasted space pointing to it. The 1 terabyte box is labeled 8 shards, 100% capacity used. The other way we can do this balancing is just put the same number of shards on each of these machines. And this will work for a while until we fill up our small machines with data. Once they're full, we're going to have to start dumping all of the data onto the big machines, which is again going to cause these read hotspots. So either we have read hotspots or we have a ton of wasted space. So in practice, we just use a homogenous system. Text, hotspots. When accessing any subset of a data set, evenly spread the load across CPUs, drives, network cards. Hotspots, when we're accessing any subset of a data set, so for example, our job search data set, you might want to query it for this month, you might want to query it for last month, you might want to query it for like two years ago. We want to make sure any of these subsets, when you query it, is going to spread the load as evenly as possible across the available CPUs, drives, and network. Text, this is hard. It's a hard problem to solve. Text, hotspots, maybe random is good enough? But the first thing we're going to look at is whether we can just kind of randomly do this balancing. 
and see if that's going to be good enough for our purposes. Text, on average about 10% more data read from the most loaded machine than the least. So if we randomly distribute our data across our system and then just like pick a machine that that data is on and read from it, we're going to be reading around 10% more data from our most loaded machine than from our least loaded machine. That's reasonable. Text, two choice randomized load balancing. Two replicas of each shard to choose from. Greedily choose the machine that currently has the least load from this client. But earlier I said we had two replicas of each shard. We can take advantage of that in order to balance better. If when we're establishing our client session, we, we have a set of shards we want to talk to. For each of those shards, for the first shard we want to talk to, we, we say based on the context of what we're doing in our session, which machine that that shard is on are we currently reading less data from right now? Next, on average about 1% more data read from the most loaded machine than the least. And we're going to pick that machine. So whenever, for your, at each choice for which machine you want to read a shard from, you're going to greedily choose the one that you've picked the least times so far. And that's going to improve our balance. And it's actually going to make a big difference in our balance. And here, we get around 1% more data from the most loaded machine than the least. And this is definitely good enough for what we need to do. That's a really good level of balance. Text, rendezvous hashing. Assignment of a shard to machines determined only by the machines that exist in a cluster. Hash all pairs of shard ID and machine ID and pick the largest two. And the way we actually distribute the shards onto these machines is not truly random. It's deterministically random. It's using this method called rendezvous hashing. The way that works is that we're determining the assignment of a shard to a machine. And we're determining it based solely on the list of machines that exist. So if you know the list of machines that exist, and you know what shard you have that you want to put on one of those machines, you can compute a deterministic function to discover that. And the way it works is we're going to hash all the pairs of that shard's identifier with each of the machines, identi uh, the identifiers for each of the machines. And each of those is going to result in a number. We're going to say a number from 0 to 1. And for those numbers, we're going to pick the largest hash value. And that, the machine that that hash value could correspond to is where we're going to put that shard. So I'm going to show you some examples. Text, shard ID, organic.2014-03-02 t 6 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds. Below, 5 rows of H, shard ID plus M1 to 5, equals varying numbers. If we have this shard with this, this name, we can hash the concatenation of that shard name with a name for machine 1, and that gives us a number. We can do it again for machine 2, get another number, and so on for all of our five machines in the system. Next, a tall rectangle with 1 at the top and 0 at the bottom. On the left side are five arrows labeled, from top to bottom, M5, M3, M4, M1, and M2. Next, M5 and M3 are highlighted. And we can see that the largest one is M5, and then M3, then M4, and so on. So if we map those hash values onto our number line here, going from 0 to 1, we can say if we want one replica of this shard, we're going to put it on M5, because that's the largest hash. Now, this really generalizes well to multiple replicas. Because if you want two replicas, you put the second one on M3, and so on. If you wanted three, you put it on M4. Text, no coordination required. Deterministic algorithm used to determine assignment, no centralized storage for shard to machine assignment. Rendezvous hashing is really nice for this because it doesn't require any coordination between the machines. They only need to know that machine list in order to determine where that shard should go. So it's a determinist deterministic algorithm. And the really great thing about it is it doesn't require any centralized storage for our shard to machine assignment. So that really simplifies the system for distributing these shards around. A row of six tall rectangles that are red or blue. Each has a blue and red arrow of varying darknesses pointing at it at a different height. Let me show you another example. This is going to be an example where we're adding a machine to our system. Because earlier I said that when we add machines, we want to maintain our balance and we want to move the smallest amount of data possible. So here we have six shards, each represented by one of these vertical bars. And we have two machines, the blue machine and the red machine. We're going to add a third machine. It's going to be the green machine. 
And for each of these shards, we, you can see we have two hashes right now. And whichever one is higher on this number line is where the machine that that shard is currently on. A large green arrow points at the first blue rectangle below the blue and red triangles. So for each of these shards, we're going to add a new hash for our new machine. So we're going to pick, pick the hash, calculate the hash. For the first shard, it was here. It's not the largest number. And, and this is with, with only one replica of each shard, by the way. The large green arrow is replaced with a small pale green one. The large green arrow points at the first red rectangle above the red and blue triangles. So for this shard, the hash is not the highest, so we're not going to put that shard on this machine. For the second shard, it is the highest. The red rectangle turns green. So here we're going to move this shard from the red machine to the green machine. The large green arrow points to the third rectangle between the red and blue arrows. Compute this for the third shard. It's not the highest, so we don't move it. The large green arrow points to the fourth rectangle between the blue and red arrows. Then it points to the fifth rectangle below the red and blue arrows. Then it points to the last rectangle, a blue one, above the blue and red arrows. The rectangle turns green. Again, for the fourth shard, we don't move it. It's not the highest. Fifth, it's not the highest, we don't move it. For the last one, it's the highest, so we're going to move uh, this shard from the blue machine to the green machine. And now we've gone from having six shards, three on each of our two machines, to six shards with two of each on each of our three machines. Text, rendezvous hashing, expected max hash for a shard as machines over machines plus one. So the math behind that, that tells us that it's actually going to rebalance in the way we want, is that the expected maximum hash for any given shard is given by machines over machines plus one. In our example, we had two machines. So the expected maximum hash for each shard is two thirds. That's the expected value of the maximum hash on that machine. Text, probability that new machine will get shard, one over machines plus one. Now, for our new machine, we're going to pick a number uniformly distributed random between zero and one. And we're going to move that shard to that machine if that number that we've picked, based on our hash, is greater than our previous max. So our previous max was 2 thirds. So we have to have a number higher than 2 thirds. And the probability of that occurring is 1 third. So it's 1 plus the number of machines over uh, 1 over machines plus 1. So probability that each shard is going to move to the new machine is 1 third. We had six shards. The expected value uh, with the probability of one third is going to be the expected value is going to be that we're going to be moving two of those shards to the new machine. So as I told you earlier, Emlitab answers questions. And this was one of the questions I said that it could answer. And I'm going to tell you how we can answer this question with the primitive operations that I've described so far. So what was the weekly average query time in the last quarter from people doing the query software? Text, one, query regroup on query software, 2. Metric regroup on time, width 7 days, 3. Get group stats on query time and count, divide after summing. This is how you can do that on Inletep. We're going to do our query regroup command on the term query software to filter our data set to only the documents where the user did the query software. Next, we're going to do our metric regroup command with the width of 7 days to get into our one week buckets that we wanted. And lastly, we're going to do our get group stats command on the query time metric in order to get the total query time for each of these weeks. We're going to also do our get group stats command on the count metric in order to get the number of queries. And we're just going to divide. And that gives us an average. So it's going to answer our question. Text, Ramses, total time in milliseconds for Q software by time. A graph with x-axis labeled time, December 2013, January 2014, February 2014. The y-axis is labeled total time in milliseconds from 50 to 200. A line rises and falls above and below the 100 line. Turns out this is a really common operation that people want to do, and we built a tool for it. It's called Ramsey's, so you can put in queries, and it will do this bucketing operation for you. So this is actually the answer to that question, computed by Ramsey's. Our average time per, per SERP for the query software in the last quarter 
was around 150 milliseconds. Our next question, what percent of job search result pages are for page two and beyond? We can calculate that too. Text, one, get group stats on count, two, query regroup on not page one, three, get group stats on count, four, divide not page one count by total count. First, we're gonna get the group stats on count. Count the total number of documents in our job search index, the number of searches users did. We're gonna do a query regroup, and this is a little more complicated Boolean query than I've shown so far, but this is for all the documents that are not on page one. So it's a negated query. So it's minus page one. So this gives us all the documents that were on page two and beyond. We're gonna get group stats again on count. So this is gonna give us the number of searches that were for beyond page one, and then we're just gonna divide. That's gonna give us a percentage. Ramses can do that too. A bar graph with time on the x-axis and percent of total counts at particular time on the y-axis. A red bar is labeled not page one and 58,001. A blue bar is labeled page one and 41,999. So, as you can see, 41, or 42% of our queries were for page one and 58% of our queries were for page two and beyond. Our next question was a little more complicated. What are the five most common queries in each country? Text, one, multi-term regroup on all values of country. Two, term group stats iteration on query. The way we're gonna calculate that one is that we're gonna use that multi-term regroup command that I described briefly earlier. We're gonna do that on all the distinct values of the country field. So we're gonna get one group per country. And then we're gonna take our term stats iterator that I described, and it's actually extended a little bit from that. So it doesn't just give us stats for a single term, it gives us stats for, the individual stats for every group within that term. So given a term, for each group which has documents that contain that term, we're going to sum the stats for those documents that contain the term and give you a group stat. So we're gonna do that for the query count. And that, for each of our countries, that can give us the number of times that that query was searched in each of those countries. Next, IQL, select count, parentheses, from job search the 1st of January 2014, the 26th of March 2014, group by country, query five. From there, we can calculate the maximum count for each country, for each group, and that's our answer. So we have another tool that can do that really easily. So you don't actually have to write code to do multi-term regroups and TGS iterations and so on. It's called IQL, which is, as you might have guessed, Imhotep query language. It's kind of like SQL. A box labeled metrics points to text, select count, that is now highlighted. The major distinction here is that our things in our select clause are not rows, and they're not columns, as in SQL. They're actually sums of metrics. A box labeled dataset points to text, from job search and dates, that is now highlighted. So, in this case, we're going to be summing the count metric from the job search dataset in this time range. A box labeled regroup points to text, country, that is now highlighted. Next, a box labeled term group stats points to text, query 5, that is now highlighted. And we're going to do these couple of regroups. The first regroup is on country, as I said. And then this last group by is actually implemented through this term group stats operator. And this query will give us our answer to our question that we had. And IQL is, is pretty powerful. Pretty much every other tool that we've developed that does analytics uh, at Indeed, all the web app tools, can use IQL, can, can do those queries that they do in a single IQL query. It, it's very powerful. Emotep is our large-scale analytics system. It's what we use for almost all of our data processing, all of our analytics, all of our decision making. We also use it for machine learning. If you were at Andrew's talk last month, you heard how. So what Emotep gives us that's really a big deal is it gives us a set of primitive operations that allow us to implement the same set of data analysis operations done on like a relational database, 
But it allows us to do it in a distributed system at, at very large scale on large amounts of data. And in that implementation, we, we have a, a, a lot of other interesting things that we've done. So this variant decoding thing is, is a pretty big deal. Text, Emotep, large-scale analytics and machine learning, variant decoding, high-performance vector instructions, stream merging, hash partition plus interleave, shard distribution, rendezvous hashing. We have this very highly optimized stream merging algorithm. And we have this uh, shard distribution using rendezvous hashing. And hopefully some of this stuff will come in use to some of you. Text, we're open sourcing Emotep. And we're also very proud to announce that in the uh, coming future, in the coming months, we're gonna be open sourcing Emotep. So all of you will be able to use Emotep for your data sets that I'm sure are fascinating. <laughs> I didn't mean that in a derogatory way at all. Like seriously, <laughs> I'm sure you all have fascinating data that you need to analyze using a tool like this. Text, how you can use Emotep. Data ingestion, TSV uploader, Hadoop. Data access, Emotep primitives, IQL. So you can use Emotep uh, in the future once we've finished with our open sourcing process. It's gonna, it's gonna take us a few months. We need you to be able to build it in your system. Like <laughs> currently it's, you know, you need our build system even to build it. So uh, the, the, what you need to know in order to, to be able to use this is you need to know how to get your data into Emotep. So you'll be able to get your data into Emotep through two methods once, once it's out. So we have what we call the TSV uploader, which you can just take a TSV, upload it into your system, uh, into the system, and Emotep will digest that and make an index shard. You can also build your shards in Hadoop directly uh, with the Flamdex Hadoop builder. So, uh, also you need to know how to access your data. So, you know, you can use the primitive operations that I've talked about tonight, or you can just use IQL. Uh, the primitives allow you to do a little bit more than IQL will allow you to do. I mean, you can't build decision trees with IQL, but for most analytics type things, IQL is pretty useful. So, I'm really excited to see what types of analytics tools people can build using IQL on top of the system. Text, next at Indeed ENG Talk, large-scale interactive analytics with Emotep. Tom Bergman, product manager. Zach Kokus, manager of marketing sciences. April 30th, 2014. HTTP colon double slash engineering dot indeed dot com slash talks. All right, so the next talk we're gonna be doing is gonna be next month. It's going to be large-scale interactive analytics with Emotep. So we're going to be talking about how we use Emotep to analyze our data and all our tools that we have for doing so. It's going to be given by Tom Bergman and Zach Kokos, and it's going to be April 30th. The audience applauds. <laughs> Text, indeed. One search, all jobs.